Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Talk Junkies, where tonight's going to be a very interesting night, as it is each and every single week here at Talk Junkies. Um, tonight, I have the pleasure of bringing on my lovely wife, Carrie Ann. How are you? Good, how are you? Good. My love, you will have to speak into the mic if, if you want people to hear you, but that's completely up to you. Um, if you're interested in last week's podcast, we did have Dan on. We talked about the Constitution. Whenever Dan comes on, that's what we do. Um we specifically talked about the importance of Marbury versus Madison and how that kind of shaped the court systems in today's society. So if you're interested in that type of thing, check out last week's podcast. We did get into a little bit of when do you really become a man? That was very interesting as well at what age. And I know that's kind of hard to do, but if that interests you, check out last week's podcast and yeah, but tonight's going to be very interesting. Um, There's a lot of things going on in the education system right now that a lot of people have questions about and aren't necessarily okay with how the public education system is going. And I feel like it's been this way for a really long time. And having kids of my own, three, my wife and I have three, um, you know, they're at that age where we have to make a decision whether or not we're going to put them in public education or not. And recently someone reached out to me wanting to join the podcast to talk exactly about what it is the public education system is and homeschooling as well. And she found us through Crow, I believe, when we were on the phone. So I appreciate that connection through Crow. We've had Crow on multiple times as well. Um, It's just a beautiful circle to be a part of. And it's a great movement to be a part of as well. And she's going to be talking about her book, Instead of Schooling. Caprice, how are you doing? Thanks for joining. Doing great. So wonderful to join both of you tonight. Well, it's wonderful to have you. Um, So before we get into like the brass tacks and, and, and all of that stuff, Kind of tell us a little bit about yourself and how, how you got on your journey. So the interesting thing is I would never have gotten involved in education if I didn't have two daughters myself. Um, I mean, the truth is that I am highly schooled. I have, you know, uh, my bachelor's from University of Virginia and an MBA in finance from Carnegie Mellon. But honestly, I hated school. So when I was finally pregnant, I was an older mother because I pursued my career first. I was pregnant at 35 and I was very excited, but I was two months into it. And I had this like crazy, like scary thought, like, what am I going to do for school for this kid? And I don't know why that occurred to me when I was pregnant, but because I hated school, I was good at it. It got me a lot of opportunities, opened a lot of doors. But I also had a midlife crisis when I was 30. And I realized that I was following what society told me was the path to happiness, making a ton of money, doing everything they said. And I was unhappy and empty and miserable. And I didn't want that for my newborn child. You know, I didn't even know if it was a boy or a girl at the time. So I started looking into opportunities for doing something different. And it just led me down this rabbit hole, I read a Sun Magazine article where John Taylor Gatto um, had his speech where he accepted the Teacher of the Year Award from New York. And it was like this scathing indictment of school. And it just opened my eyes. And I was like, I'm not crazy. There is a reason that kids hate school. It's because it's not designed for learning. It's not designed to help them know who they are or what their gifts are. And I just determined that I was going to educate my kids in a way that they would not have a midlife crisis like I did at 30. Rock on. (laughs) No, I mean, maybe that's kind of what I'm going through right now. (laughs) I don't know. Because, I mean, Phoenix is at that age, so. Yeah, I just turned 30, so I, I, I feel that. Yeah, so, like you, you follow the recipe for success and happiness that you've been given, and you realize at some point this isn't working for you. Yeah, after having yeah. kids, though, like I feel like I'm successful and happy. Like even if I didn't do anything else the rest of my life, like having kids like gave me that. Right, right. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think that was the thing because then when I – Um, had my daughter, I remember looking into her eyes, she was a couple days old, and I saw this depth of wisdom and understanding in this newborn baby. And I was like, you are not an empty vessel that came in for me to fill. You have lessons to teach me. Yep. And we're going to be on this journey together. And it was, I mean, that was really like a bonding experience. She was like literally two or three days old. And I looked and I was like, wow. Look at this little soul that's been entrusted to me to help grow into whatever being she has meant to be. 
And you have such a limited time to do that because they grow so fast. I know that's the age old saying. Anytime that I'm talking with people at work, they're like, man, just don't blink an eye because it goes by that fast. And it truly does. Uh, again, with our daughter being five and then our second being three, and we get the pleasure of having our third child who's eight months old. And that's going by very quickly as well. But with the education system in general, let's kind of start it off here. How did we get to this point in the public education system where it's failing so many, so many kids? Because it was designed that way, like quite honestly. So I initially wanted to home educate my kids because I hated school. I was bored. It was easy for me, but I hated it. And so that was my initial impetus. And then as I went on the journey, so my oldest is 20. So she was homeschooled from birth till K-12, got a free ride to college. So that's why I feel like I could talk about this because so many people are nervous. Like, yeah, it's easy for a homeschooling mom of elementary kids to talk about it because that's when they play. But I have walked her through every phase of the home education process. And the reason, so initially I just wanted them to have the space and the time to discover who they were, how they learned, what they loved, what were their gifts, how they, could they offer them to the world. And then when I sat down to write my book, instead of schooling, I was like, well, honestly, it's because I didn't want them institutionalized. I know a lot of people talk about, yes, yeah, school indoctrinates kids. And indeed it does, because it gives them a very limited view of the world. And it, it like spoon feeds them exactly what the people in control want them to believe. But beyond that, it institutionalizes people. And that's what I realized because forget the content of the curriculum, which is a lot of what people focus on and they distract us with the curriculum and the testing. What I wrote my book about was instead of schooling, look beyond the school building, look beyond the amazing adults, the teachers that are in there doing their best in a system that was designed to dumb people down, make them compliant, make them sit still when their little bodies want to go outside and play and dig in the dirt and have fun and scream and do whatever little kids are designed to do. It makes them sit still, be quiet, give the right answer, get permission to go to the bathroom. I mean, the entire thing is just getting little souls to be institutionalized so that when they grow up, they will be those obedient workers, those compliant voters, those taxpayers that the system needs to perpetuate the system. So when everyone says the school sale, this, you know, the school system is failing, I go, absolutely not. It's succeeding because it's doing exactly what it was designed to do. And the irony is it started in Massachusetts with a man called Horace Mann who went around Massachusetts evangelizing schooling. And guess what this man did with his three sons? Homeschooled he homeschooled them. them. <laughs> That's yes, indeed. <laughs> he did. He wasn't going to put his sons in the system that he was making everyone else go into. So. <laughs> so I was reading earlier and it was just like a Google search. And my daughter is like this to a T where she is a teacher's pet. I want to say teacher's pet, but she's not like, she doesn't have a teacher except me. But, and it says like those that are like teacher's pet and like that want to like show that they're like an A student that they wouldn't succeed in a homeschooling environment. Is that true? I mean, no, that's not true. That's not true. I mean, that's that my older daughter. Okay. Yeah. I, it was just wants... a Google search and I saw that and I was just like, that's, I know that's not tr true. See, that's, but that's I, Google right there already trying to get rid I, of people I, to homeschool. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, actually like, like to turn the lens on that, I mean, one book that I would you know, highly recommend is by Kristen Olson, who wrote a book called wounded by school. And she set out to interview really successful adults, like wildly successful and say, how did your school experience contribute to your success? And she had to completely change her thesis because what she found is all of these people were wounded by school and they survived in spite of school, but they were carrying these wounds around. So if you're one of those that like 
you know, wants to be acknowledged, wants to be the teacher's pet, wants, then you're going to spend your whole life looking for the gold stars, right? Exactly. And so that was me, like I was good in school. And so I don't like, I don't like, uncertainty. I want to have the answer, you know, there's a lot of things. And if you're bad in school, then you think you're stupid because I'm also, you know, an executive coach and I've coached so many people who have great businesses they are succeeding. And they look at me and they go, I couldn't do school math. I thought I was stupid, but I can do my finances for my business because school math isn't real math. You know, it's like the whole thing is an artificial learning environment that makes most of us feel kind of stupid. Yeah. I mean, I wanted to do meteorology. And so I went to KU for that and I could not pass like Calc 2. And I felt so dumb for that. And I know that I'm not a dumb person, but it, it just sucks. I, I know that you have to like pass physics and calculus in order to like get to what you want. But that's the whole thing too in college is that they, they make you pass all these prerequisites that sometimes you don't actually need them and then I just feel like it's money too. Like it's a waste of money to have to do that. Oh, abs- you know, absolutely. I mean, I think the, the course that takes most kids out is algebra. Yes. Yeah. Algebraic thinking is helpful. Algebra two, useless. Like, and, and I know that because homeschooling my oldest or home educating my oldest, I, I walked her through algebra two and she kept going, how come you don't you know, know this? I mean, I got an MBA in finance from Carnegie Mellon, right? I'm like, well, because I haven't used it since high school. So I have to look it up and remember it and you're going to do it and you're never going to use it again. But in the process, it's going to make you feel kind of incompetent and stupid. And then you go, well, why does everybody has to have to do that? Because at a certain point, Harvard decided for admittance to Harvard, you needed trigonometry, you needed calculus, you needed this, you needed that. So all of the high schools around the country added it to their curriculum. I mean, the whole system's kind of rigged, right? And so why don't they teach like taxes and stuff, you know? Cause like, you know, you get out of school and then you don't even know how to do your own taxes. I'm still learning and I'm 30, you know? And I hate that. I learned how to like write a check in like, you know, my lifestyle class or whatever it was, but they don't teach you the real stuff that you need to know to succeed right. in life. Well, and then it goes to, I had to actually educate myself on how our monetary system works later. I mean, don't you think you'd learn that MBA finance, Carnegie Mellon, maybe they teach you how the monetary system work. I had one professor who got a Nobel prize in economics and he said, the only purpose of the government is to redistribute wealth. Alan Meltzer said that. And I was like, well, that's interesting. But now that I understand the monetary system is debt based, that we need consumers to compete, you know, purchase, 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 so the economy grows. I have come to the conclusion that our entire school system is made to create consumers and workers that will just keep the corrupt system afloat. So I think for any parent that's saying, well, I can't home educate my kids because it's complicated and they look at the school system my biggest message that I want to give parents is you can do it because you're your kid's first teacher. Nobody knows your children better than you do. And schooling is not learning. So maybe, you know, that would be a a really good conversation for us to have because schooling is the process of putting information that they want into your kids' brains and beliefs into your kids' brains and getting them to sit still, be quiet, obey outside authority, listen for the bell, raise your hand, you know, all of the behavioral modification that they've purposely built in. But then what is learning? So like when, when the two of you think about how you learn today, let's say that you want to learn something new. Do you go to school or do you just actually figure it out? Do you do it? Do you roll up your sleeves and just try it and fail and figure it out? That's how humans learn. That's how we're designed to learn. Active learning, that's how we're designed. We're designed to learn so that we can adapt to our environment and survive. So, sorry, real quick. So before, I definitely want to get into what is homeschooling and learning and and all that. I think it, it kind of blows my mind that I never looked at it the way that you described that 
the school system isn't failing. It's succeeding because it's creating, you know, workers like you described. And, and we've had many podcasts throughout the past four years. And that's something that never clicked within the conversation that we really had with each other when we were talking about it. So like a two part question, um, one, so you, you're to the belief that it's beyond written. And I guess repair is not even the right word. It's never going to change because they have the system how they want it. And it's working. It's a well-oiled machine. And it's generating these people who are going to continuously do what they want them to do. But my, my, my next question would be to that is, what was, what was the education system like before Rockefeller got, got involved in the, in the early 1900s or the gentleman, you, the John Mann or whatever his name was? What was education like before public education? Yeah, before Horace Mann and the yeah. utopian socialists took over. Yeah. It was home education. Um, and sometimes like a one room schoolhouse. And it was important that, I mean, at the time, you know, it was important to learn to read. A lot of it was because they wanted them children to be able to read the Bible. But I mean, everyone was very educated in the law and like just, you know, basically you have to be able to do basic numeracy and reading. And then you're a contributing member to society, young like adolescence didn't exist. I mean, even when you look at Thomas Edison, he was on a train at 13 selling candy overnight. Like you were an adult young and you were incorporated into society very young. And even until World War II, most, you know, even though, okay, the other thing that people need to understand is compulsory education was forced on Americans and they marched kids to school at gunpoint to get them to go. So they finally got most Americans to accept you had to do like elementary education. But until World War II, that's where it ended. And then people went back and they worked on the farms because that's the where they were. We were an agricultural society and they scratched their heads and they said, well, we're not indoctrinating people as we need to. So what are we going to do? So the National Education Association invented middle school. They invented high school because they wanted to keep people in school longer so they would lose their sense of purpose so they would get out and just be as lost as confused as most 18 year olds are so, so it's all invented so like in, in within that environment that they created it has led us to where we are now um and when i say that i'm specifically talking about with innovation um with the cities that you see that are built within the united states these large massive cities um i'm not saying like, I don't, I don't, I'm right there with you. Like, I don't agree with any, any of that with what, I mean, taking, you know, putting kids at gunpoint to force them to go and, and do these, go into the education system. But I guess what I'm trying to say is look at what had, what it's created from an innovation standpoint. Like, I, I think that's really the only argument I have towards it is it has created this and granted the system. I hate it. I completely hate it, but it, there has been some good that's came out of it. I guess. I don't know. <laughs> do you see what I'm trying to say? I don't know. It's kind of weird. So what do you mean by innovation? Well, I'm just, I mean, when was like middle school and high school? When did that first, you said that was after World War II? Yeah, that kind of came about probably like in the 30s and the 40s. Okay. So within creating obedient human beings in a slave class, they have created this monstrosity of what is America now. And I know we say we're the freest country and all that stuff. I'm again, I'm against all of this, but what I'm saying, what look at what it's created, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Right. So I guess what I'm going to argue against is technology has definitely improved our lives in so many ways. OK, and I'm going to say that because my mother grew up in depressed Appalachia in a sharecropper's family. She didn't have electricity till she was 16. So I grew up with a lot more comfort than she did. And you could definitely say industrial revolution, education, technology, washing machines, all of that, yes. The problem that we're facing now is that we live in a hyper-materialist paradigm, right? where we all think that the only thing that exists is the physical matter, that there's nothing that exists that we can't see. And what I lay forth in my book is that innovation and creativity does not come from your brain, nor does your consciousness or your imagination. It comes from your mind, with it, which exists beyond your brain. 
So if you just educate or school the intellect of people, it's garbage in, it's garbage out. That's the brain. It's a tool for the mind. It's a tool for your consciousness. So the, the men that invented schooling were um, religious humanists. John Dewey was one of 34 signers of the original um, religious humanist manifesto. And their goal was to create a society with no God. They wanted to replace God with the state. And they wanted the teachers to be on the pulpit. So if you look at children as if they have no soul, no inner calling, no gifts that they came to give the world, then they're just these moldable, physical things that you can mold to be good workers for the machine. They're machines and the cog, right? So yes, modernism and industrialism has given us a lot of comforts but when you look around, are most people happy? Right. And I, I think or, that would be, and I almost, I, I completely agree, because I think that let's say that none of that existed and, and public education didn't exist and people were to homeschool, and we'll, we'll definitely get into this. I think it would be a, a more beautiful place for sure. So the, the thing that, okay, even if children are being forced to memorize and regurgitate and it's making them dumber, which has been proven over and over and the whole word instruction creates a literacy. What the, the, the abuse that the schooling process does, and I really want people to look beyond the school building because parents have such a, like, a loyalty there to their local elementary school and the teachers there. So look beyond that. What I'm trying to point people to is the schooling process, which takes kids out of nature, out of play, out of their bodies, and forces them to sit still as if they're just like a meat sack with a brain and puts information out, information in, information, you know, that's not how, pe that's not how humans learn. There's been like, humans learn when they are relaxed, at ease, playful, creative, imaginative, in in like conversation with each other, collaborative, like the entire human learning process is the antithesis of schooling. Like even look at like the workplace. If you're if you have to do a project in the workplace, are they like stay in your office, close your computer, it's a closed book exam, figure it out on your own, remember what you were taught in school. That's not how life works. That's deep. That's really deep. That's great. There's no there's no chance that we send our kids to public education. <laughs> so what do, what do you say to the people that like, because I've seen fights on social media where they're like, I don't have the luxury to stay home and do that with my kids. So like, what is the argument for that for the parents that have to work to provide a home for their kids? So I'm a single mother, and I have worked the whole way through. Fair enough. And that's the argument right there. <laughs> it's messy. Yeah. It's whatever, but you make it work, you know? And I think for the people who think that they have to reproduce school at home and they're going to march kids through a curriculum and it's going to be a seven hour day. Yeah. That's not going to work. Yeah. But if you're going to march your kids through a school curriculum, send them to school because they'll be better off with their kids. But if you're going to like observe your kids I've got like on my website, a great um, learning styles assessment to figure out how they learn. If you're going to let them play when they're young, be out in nature, cook, you know, if you're going to do natural learning, you do not have to be the teacher. You are the guide on the side. And the more that your kids can see you engaged in life and doing what you love and pursuing your hobbies, like if you want kids to learn to read, have a house that reads. And I'm going to give a caveat also because people are going to be like, well, what if you have a special needs kids? My oldest daughter is profoundly dyslexic, which means that she has no, like dyslexia is a term that's so overused, but she has no phonemic awareness, which most of us are born with. But that is the classic definition of dyslexia. So she cannot take apart and put together words. The most creative speller. She'll still ask me how to spell 
simple words. It doesn't make her stupid. She just does thinks in a totally different way. She's a right-brained visual spatial learner. So schooling is for auditory sequential learners, which only 5% of us learn that way. Why is it designed that way? I don't know, maybe so most of us feel stupid. So the thing is like, there is really no, like I only learned that she was dyslexic when she was 13 after tons and tons of trials and testing. And like, why don't they test every kindergartner for phonemic awareness? I don't know. But the thing is you, if you love your child, if you trust your child, if you just create a life that is full and joyful like they will they will learn you know like there's there's no timetable there's no set curriculum that they need to learn um but yeah as a single parent you just you make alliances you create groups i mean i created a you know a self-directed learning center when i was in california sudbury school in north carolina like because kids do want to be together they don't want to just be at home with mom they want to be with other kids so but I am, I am, I'm very optimistic that this is the opportunity to create a real ecological learning network where it's not just like, you know, single family units that have to do it. We can do it in community. So, and I know that COVID had kind of sparked you into writing your book, or that's kind of when you started writing your book. There was a local gentleman out here in Kansas. He was a, he, he was in the public education teaching. I, I can't, I can't remember um, I need to reach out to him because I, I wanted to talk to him as well. But I guess what he ended up doing is exactly what you're talking about. You know, he opened up his own private practice, I guess, you know, for, for homeschooling. And now he's up to, you know, it, the classes are full. He has to hire more teachers because that's the way that the, this is kind of trending. What's crazy to me is that things like COVID and things like recently, and I know you and I talked about it on the phone, and I don't know how true I need to look more into it with the CDC I guess it's more of a guidance for the COVID vaccine to be part of the inoculations for children. It's not set in stone um, that they have to get it. It's more of a recommendation is what they're saying now. You know, they're trying to brush it off, I guess. But it, these types of things are pushing people to want to do homeschooling, you know. And it's, it's weird that the system is failing itself because it shouldn't. It's been this well-oiled machine for so long. But you're right, right now is the greatest opportunity for a movement like this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and I, I, when, so I did sit down and write my book when, um, I mean, I live in a state where the lockdowns were very brief, but I remember looking around and the thought that spurred me to write this book was that if people hadn't been schooled, they wouldn't be compliant. Which is weird and because I, 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 I hated, that. sorry, I hated school as well and I never paid attention. I don't know if I have ADHD or whatever it is, but I coasted along. I had like a 2.8 GPA or 2.7. I don't remember. I excelled in the classes that I enjoyed and I didn't excel in the classes that I didn't. And I, you know, I was just more focused on women and, and having fun and meeting new people and having conversations. I just didn't really ever care to be in public education. It wasn't for me. And maybe that's why I defied the lockdowns. Granted, we lived in a, in a city where it wasn't and in any way, shape, or form, hardcore, other than mask and, and buildings, but I see exactly what you're talking about. Well, and here here's like a telling you GPA. Like, what do you think the average GPA of millionaires is? Most of them drop out. Two point nine. Yeah. Like there is no correlation with success in school and success in life. That's a myth, right? Right. And, and then the other thing that I really, really want to caution people about, because I put this in my book and I was horrified as I started looking at the privacy issues, because, you know, you got Zuckerberg and you've got other um, the alt school movement from Silicon Valley where they decided that schooling, you could just create playlists like you create these Apple Music playlists and you park a kid down in front of a computer and they will just check off their playlist. Right. I mean, it was a horrible experiment and um, like families really, really complained about the fact that their kids weren't getting like any interpersonal interaction and there was no privacy and they were tracking everything. So what do they do with the alt schools? They shut them down, created this platform that they started selling to public schools. And then I found this, uh, 
this um, company out of, I think it was Boston, but basically what they would do, and I have pictures in my book, they would put these sensors, like EEG sensors, mm -hmm. around the heads of children so that they could track whether they were paying attention or not. And through their EEG waves, like, were they engaged, blah, blah, blah. And they piloted this in China. Yep. And even in China, when the pictures came out, the parents were up in arms. But this is what is coming, people. Like, they want to track your children's every thought, every emotion, every keystroke. And the ed tech companies, like, <laughs> you think – Facebook and all of that, like they are pouncing on this like $13 trillion industry. Like first the textbook manufacturers were like raking it in, but the tech companies are just waiting to like invade your children's brains. And I used to tell my kids, it doesn't matter how old you are when you learn to read, you know, because gifted and talented children learn at four or 12, right? But now they're going to know when you learn to do anything, they're going to have your entire. Uh, I mean, if that isn't like the number one reason to take your kids out of public school, I don't know what is. And I mean, I know some people that like would put their kids in public school for that reason, which is crazy to me because they, they, I don't know. I just. Well, it's all part of the indoctrination campaign or whatever you want to call it that the United States it's a trial run or, or not even a trial run but what we're existing in right now is, is exactly that and those people I don't I, I don't know why those people are that way or why they don't question it you know what I'm saying everyone's different and they find it at a different time at least I would hope so but um you're you're not wrong though like we've had John Kleizek John Kleizek on and he was a uh, professor at a community college or a teacher sorry and he talked ex ex exactly about that. It's a technocratic techro state that we're entering into, and and yeah. yeah, he described it in the same way. So that's one of two people, both who are t teachers. That it, you're right, it's coming to a school near you. It's a social credit system is exactly what they want, and it's happening in China. And ho I right. just I don't see it happening in America. I don't think people are there yet to where they can implement a social credit system in America because people people would freak out. Yeah, and again, no, I agree. And I, I also want to say, like, I completely acknowledge the fact that public school is the safest place for some kids who have abusive households. For sure. That was so I'm answer. I'm not saying that, but they, too, actually deserve education, not schooling. Right. One hundred percent. So let's kind of get into your book a little bit. I know you kind of already have, but um homeschooling and, and again you talked about it was before public education that's how people were, were taught and that's how they learned they entered society at a younger age like you talked about but like homeschooling in general um what do you say to people like let's just get into the, the basic form of what it means and, and what it's about so i think the the first thing that you need to do when you want to home educate your child is just observe and the best questions to ask your kids is like, what are you interested in? How do you want to spend your time? What are you curious about? Because especially when they're young, before that's been drilled out of them, don't you know that your kids, don't they have the best questions? Yep. Why yeah. this? Why that? Why this? Right? Yes. Like my daughter, when she was five, was like, mom, how did, how did we have language? Where did language come from? I mean, that's like, so we like emailed some anthropologists and they were like, well, we don't really know. I mean, they just asked the best questions. So if you can let put your child, so put your child in the center and let their curiosity and their wonder and their awe about this world, just like guide their interests and don't be worried if they're like fabulously interested in something for like a few weeks or a month and then they drop it. And then they're on to the next thing because that's kind of how it works. It's messy, but it's fun. You know, it's this like process of invention because we humans are designed to learn about ourselves and our environment and how we fit in it. And they want to be part of it. They want to be of service. They want to be part of adult life. They don't want to feel like they're a burden. So have them do cook, teach them to cook, teach them to do this. You know, like in indigenous tribes, they had three year olds tending the fire at three. Wow. And I remember my daughter was doing a service project when we were in California and they wouldn't let them walk the dogs at the Humane Society till they were 16. So liabilities for get, be, getting sued, maybe. But want to look, like 
we are wired to learn active learning by doing, not by sitting down and studying what somebody else did. Right. So at what point does the state get involved with homeschooling or how does, how does that process work? Does, are there people involved making sure that your kids are on some type of curriculum or is it, you know, it's, it's whatever it is you want to teach your kid kind of like what you're describing. Is there anyone else involved or is it just the parents? So I've homeschooled in many different states. Um, when I was in California, you had to create your private school by doing a private school affidavit. And then you kept track of attendance and making sure that they were doing certain hours and certain subjects. Um, in Texas, you don't even have to register. Like they don't even know you exist. It's beautiful. Um, so and it's just, it's state by state requirements. There are some states like Pennsylvania is harder. Other states are harder. Um, I also see what's happening with a lot of, so I guess this is a good, good time to talk about the encroachment of the public on the private. Cause we talked about what, how did you educate children before compulsory government schooling? It was private. It was a family affair. The government had nothing to do with it. So I would recommend that anybody who wants to home educate their children to really go into some of these resources that are saying, how do you live more in the private and less in the public? Because honestly, educating your children is a private affair. The government should have no influence on it. 100%. Well, so at least shouldn't. So then why is California and New York so much different because i was reading earlier on a group i'm in on facebook and seeing how like california i don't know about your like vaccine stance but like california like they're going after homeschoolers now that they have to be completely vaccinated not like yet but that's what they're going after and like a lot of people pull their kids because of like what's come to light with the covid stuff and like you know a lot of people don't want to do that anymore so like why why is California and New York like, why? You know what I mean? Do you, cause you lived there. So like, why are they so in your business? So one thing that I really looked at when I was doing research for my book was the National Education Association, which are like 3.2 million teachers are part of. And I wrote the book in 2020. So I was looking at their like 2018 to 2019 principles that they wrote on their website and it was shocking to me. I mean, first of all, they said, we acknowledge that, you know, there's a white supremacist society and we need to like fix that. That's the National Education Association that teachers belong to. And I, in my book, I was like, well, I'm not going to take a stance on that. I just want you to know how highly politicized it is. But you also need to know the National Education Association is very against homeschooling. It's a big threat. So there are some powerful lobbies that are going to do whatever they can to shut it down. And it's really been the conservative Christians that have kept homeschooling alive. But now a lot of families are choosing to homeschool for other than religious rights. And so, um, yeah, they're, they're trying to encroach on our, our liberty. But once again, like it's the public trying to encroach on the private. And who are you? But you're a man or a woman on the earth with children that you are responsible for. You know, I mean, that's what I talk about in my book. Like education is not a right given to you by the government. Like education is your natural right from the creator to figure out who you are, what your gifts are and how you're going to serve schooling on the other hand is a government privilege so in your mind if you can separate education and learning from schooling schooling's a privilege for taxpayers education and learning is a right from the creator for men and women on the land it's just different it's completely different it is. I'm trying to. I'm trying to think of where hi hierarchy comes in. Um, and I, I know this is completely off subject, but I'm kind of curious on your thoughts on it. Like within, I mean, I, I think what I'm trying to ask here is is exactly what we're talking about. How the government with public education, how it kind of perpetuates hierarchy. But I think that hierarchy is kind of instilled into us from the creator. And I don't know if you've seen it based on 
your, your work with homeschooling, does that kind of get rid of that hierarchy type of, um, type of tendencies that come in, that they come into humans? Or I, I know that's kind of a weird question, but. Um, well, I mean, I guess I'm just thinking the relationship I had with my children, um, because, you know, when I grew up, you know, children were supposed to be um, seen and not heard. So there was a lot of authoritarian hierarchical parenting. And if you can view your children as beings that have come in to teach you something, um, the hierarchy kind of disappears, which doesn't I, I, I've seen too many families that go, oh, you know, unschooling or self-directed education that means we don't parent like no no you parent you have boundaries you have limits on your children but you don't have the hierarchy of thinking that you're this wise being because you're an adult and they have no wisdom because children have tremendous wisdom and i i honestly think that if we can educate children in a way that preserves their creativity and their imagination, they can solve the problems that they're inheriting from older generations because they're inheriting a lot. Oh, yeah. So is, are, are there any other countries that are more so geared towards homeschooling as opposed to public education that you know of? You know, it's, it's tough. I mean, Europe's a tough place. Like homeschooling is not allowed in Germany. It's being kind of forced out in Australia, New Zealand. Um, Jeez. It's, it's a kind of a tough place for most home education. And I want to say why, because, you know, they said if you can get a child for the first seven years, you can mold them into anything you want. Yep. So the war is against our children right now, not just with the health mandates, but with education, because if you can take kids and force them from a young age to sit still and obey authority, then when you try and lock them down for some health scare, they're going to behave, right? Yeah, that's wild, though. There's no countries that there's over, there's majority of homeschooling I, th that you know yeah. of. Sorry. I mean, Spain has some pretty good pockets of homeschoolers. Um but, you know, a lot of a lot of world schoolers, they just want to get on a boat and travel, you know, right. get out of the, all their jurisdiction. Well, I guess like, I mean, like third world countries, that's I mean, not necessarily homeschooling. That's, you know, you're living day to day. You have to do what it is necessary to live in life. And those kids are exposed to that. They have to start working at an early age. They're not really they, you know what I'm saying? Like they don't get access yeah. to any type of education. But in a sense, they do. You know, they're learning how to live. You know, they're learning how to get right. food, water, all that stuff. I don't know. But. Well, so there's a fabulous documentary by Carol Black, who she and her husband did the Wonder Years television series. And I have no idea of her politics, but they did a wonderful documentary called Schooling the World. And it will blow, blow you away because she goes and with an anthropologist, oh, his name was Wade, I can't remember exactly. But um, they go and they show how bringing schooling into these developing countries in the third world, you've got people that are living, I mean, they're not wealthy, right? But they're, they're feeding themselves, they're in joyful communities, they're just living very simple, basic lives. But they bring school in and they convince them that that's not enough, they got to go to the cities and they kind of push them into like a starvation, like slave labor situation. So if we think that we Western countries are doing a good job when we're importing schooling to these countries, we need to think again. Yeah, because you do see a lot of companies like advertising, like, look at us, like, you know, we help with like, you know, building schools and school supplies and stuff. And it's, you know, they're actually doing more harm than good in some instances. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a shocking documentary. And I mean, I know me saying that's going to people probably going to send me a lot of hate mail because you've got a lot of stories of going in and raising, you know, young girls up to start businesses and everything. And and I am all for that. Like, let's go in and do micro loans and micro businesses, because it's been shown that if you can give women some money, they like they become the economic engines of their community. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying that this. Um, schooling model that we're exporting is we could do better 100 percent, man this is wild this is this is very wild um I, it's just it i don't know I'm, I'm kind of speechless honestly because i i don't see like a way out of it because I, and i've known this that we're 
way past, you know, the train's not going to derail, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. But I think that the, the movement of homeschooling will help, and maybe it could slowly be turned back. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah. you've, you've had this, you know, 70 to 80, or I guess close to 100 years of public education. And that's a, that's a it, you know, it's a lot of people that they've indoctrinated and people that they put into these positions. And I've always just felt so dismal and so down and, and no hope for society. And I think that maybe the only way out is if you see a large amount of people start to start homeschooling. Because you're right, it starts with the kids. That's the- Right. Well, and think about your children because they're young. I mean, look at how much they are full of life and joy and wonder, right? And I mean, I've just seen so many, talked to so many educators and so many statistics that by the third grade, that light in the eyes of children just starts dimming, you know? So the children are our future and we need to protect their imaginations and their curiosity. And they're, they've got like an innate intelligence. They've got an c- intelligence connected to universal intelligence, which schooling shuts down by making them rely on the intellect. The intellect is a tool of our soul and our intelligence. But we, okay, if education, if school were the ticket, then our society would look different because our society is being run by very well school people. How's that going? Right. So what is a what does a society look like if what do you envision a society looking like if it was majority well I guess I kind of answered my own question sorry because before public education that's what people did and that's what society looked like but I guess in in the modern era what would a society look like with pub or with homeschooling So if children were allowed to play freely to be in nature so that they were loved nature Like they're not just diagramming the parts of a plant in a classroom. They're actually looking at the plants, having a relationship, realizing that what we know from science, that plants actually communicate with each other, that if you're in another room and you're thinking about cutting a plant, they have a reaction. Like, why don't we teach the real science, not the bogus science? Let them be in nature, let them play, let them be in groups, let them cooperate. They found that children are naturally altruistic. And I am going to say a caveat. I do realize that maybe 20% of society have a personality disorder. So let's take the 80% that don't. The 20% that have personality disorders, the 1% that are psychopaths, maybe they're not in this group. But the 80% of us who are functional people, who have hearts, who want to connect with a higher purpose, let them be in nature, let them play let them explore, let them figure out who they are, how they learn. And with my children around the age of 11, 12, they've had freedom to know who they are, they've played, then they really actually want to engage in academic pursuits by choice. And they're serious and they do it well. It's not because they're forced to learn to read at a certain age or they're forced to sit down and do math when they're not interested. Then they go deep in subjects. Then they can really figure out what is this world about because they're curious and they're still connected to their imagination and they can ask good questions and they can come up with solutions. And I just think if if they're allowed to follow their bliss and their curiosity and their interests rather than being beaten down so they can work in a cubicle, the world looks different. That is wild. That is absolutely wild that they have literally for the past hundred years have done this to children. That's crazy. They have literally like shut their brains down to where they're not even doing that. You know, like for you, and and I know this is one example, and I'm sure you've seen many other examples within the homeschooling um, bubble or whatever you want to call it, where, where when at that age, they want to get into finance and they're serious about it at 12, but you have millions upon millions of kids who ne- were never granted that right because they were forced spoon fed public education. Mm-hmm. So I guess that your, your answer, like if we were in a world full of just homeschooled people, I mean, this world would be, I'm, I'd never advocate for utopia, but damn, it would be close. <laughs> well, and it's funny because my father like reads the wall street journal. So he sent me this article, what homeschoolers are doing right. right? <laughs> and I kept it. And it just says a new study suggests 
their kids are healthier, happier, and more virtuous than public school graduates. Now, the one thing, as they say, is they're less apt to go to college because they're off building businesses and doing their own thing. But, I mean, there have been research studies that show that homeschool kids actually are happier and do better. So Paul has a friend that was homeschooled. He has a couple of friends that were homeschooled. And I wasn't there for the conversation. Paul just kind of told me to go talk to him about it. But he said that he... I don't, did he say that he like regretted being homeschooled because he didn't get like the full like experience because he was homeschooled all through high school and everything. And I don't know. He just, I think for him though, he was and, and again, this isn't today's society, but no, I, I, I um, he was, he's in a, in a city South of our, or he, where he was homeschooled in the city South of ours, um, probably 30 or 40 miles. So you're talking about a population of a few hundred or if not a few thousand people. So he wasn't really exposed to a lot of other kids. You know what I'm saying? I think that that was probably like his biggest regret, like having conversations with him outside. And I'm like, hey, man, what do you think I should do? Like, we're talking about it. You were homeschooled. What, what, What was it like for you? He's like, yeah, my mom, you know, we'd go out. We would be with other kids. But like, you're in the middle of nowhere. You know what I'm saying? So I think that that's kind of where he was coming from. Well, and I, I mean, I do, I, I, I agree um, that it's challenging for some kids. And I think I told Paul, so I homeschool my other, my oldest K to 12. My youngest is in public high school and she made that choice. And she said, I'm doing enough for the learning, but to make friends. So once again, I had a conversation um, with Peter Gray, who wrote um, Free to Play And I said, I'm kind of freaked out. And he goes, if you didn't let her do what she wanted to do, that would be abuse because you have raised her to be self-directed. Does she enjoy it? Mm. She's bored. She's bored a lot of the time. She realizes a lot of what she's doing is kind of useless. She's dual enrolled in community college, which she likes, but she's got great friends. And that's why she went. And And the caveat to that, sorry, with Jordan is look at him. Like, I mean, like he's kind of has his, I mean, he's extremely talentedly gifted at carpentry. Like he is just amazing at it, you know, and that could be a testament to being homeschooled. I don't. Yeah, he's, his mom is the same way too. Like they, and his sister was, was she homeschooled? Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. And And she's an artist. She flies plane or, well, no, she doesn't fly. She does fly. Yeah, she flies planes and everything. She's got her pilot license and all that stuff. Yeah. But just to him, like, he is good at that. But, like, was that enough is what I'm saying. Right. It's like I – that's what I struggle with, too, is, like, our do- oldest daughter, Phoenix, is, like – she's our teacher's pet is what I say. Is like, she would thrive in school. I know that, like, school would, like – it's – we're not going to do it. But I know that she would love it because she is just – how would you describe her? Like, she's just, I don't know. She would just do really well, but I don't want to, I don't want to expose her to that. I don't want to, I don't know. With all, I don't know. Yeah. With all the things exactly like with what you're talking about and and just when you look at it at its, at its core, not common core, (laughs) that's probably a whole nother podcast, but the core of the education system, like what she's saying, what they instill to you at that five, like you're basically making them brain dead, honestly, but Right. And so at least my youngest would like, she was so firmly established and I love learning and I'm self-directed and no one's going to take that from me. And she tried seventh grade and, uh, and then she quit and then she went back to high school. So it's been in and out. But the interesting thing is, so I started a Sudbury school when my daughter was three because I wanted her to learn in community, but it was a hard sell because Sudbury is a lo- very, very loose. It's like unschooling and community. So I've always tried to create opportunities for my kids to be with other kids. When I was in California, we did a self-directed um, learning. I did a self-directed learning group for two days a week. And then I got half a million dollars to start two self-directed learning charter schools in California. I got half a million dollars from the US Department of Education and I couldn't get them authorized And the assistant superintendent said, because I was doing it for an organization I was working for in Canada, self-design, he said, I can see how self-design allows children to learn what they're interested in at the same pace, but that doesn't fit with the California Department of Education that requires children to do the exact same thing at the exact same time. And we would have taken $5,000 per student. So 
I, I mean, I guess the reason that I really want to talk to parents now and empower them is if more of us make this choice, then there's more families to come together and the kids aren't being home educated alone because kids do want to be with other kids, but they don't necessarily want to be locked up in a room with other kids the same age because age mixing is wonderful. Older kids love to mentor younger kids. And it's more important that they group together around shared interests than shared ages. Yeah, no, hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, we even, I, I see that within our own, like the block that we live in because our daughter's what she's really good friends with, you know, a girl who's down the street, who's one year younger or within like six to eight months. And they're like best friends, but you know what? We have another girl down the block who's like, what, 11 or 12? And whenever that 11 or 12-year-old comes over, Phoenix is all about that 11 or 12-year-old. She's no longer wants to be friends with the four-year-old. You know what I'm saying? Granted, they're almost the mm -hmm. same identical age. You're, you're not wrong. Like, it, this is, it's just crazy to me. I, I, this, this is like the precipice. This is like, this is like the most eye-opening thing to me is this. This is where it all starts, and this is where it begins to fix what it is it's called America and the, the American dream and what is the constitution? Like this, this is it. This is, it's the beginning of what it is to be a child and going in, not into public education. I, I, I don't know. I, I felt like I had a good rant going there, but then I lost it. <laughs> well, and I think one of the biggest arguments for public education is that it um, helps people who are in socioeconomically disadvantaged climb the ladder. And that, but that's all by that's all by design as well, though. Like they they put everyone. You see you see the the amount of wealth being extracted from the middle class and the poor class, and how the the top elites are extracting all this money, and they're creating this environment to where it's almost impossible to where you can homeschool. In, in, right. Even if you can homeschool, you 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 have the time to homeschool, but then you instantly have to go to work and you have to find a babysitter, and then you can't take your kids out to go see other kids, so they can play with other kids who are different ages. You know what I'm saying? They've created a to be almost near impossible to do it, which well, is smart. Well, I would challenge anybody to show me an elite who actually put their kids in public school. Same with an elite who gives their yep. kids a vaccine <laughs> or an iPad yep. or a TV. Yeah. I completely agree. Yeah. So then why, why do they create that system if they're not going to follow it? What is the point? I mean, I don't know if you know the answer to that. That's just kind of like. No, out. I do. And in my book, I put this great quote from Woodrow Wilson, who before he was president, was president of Princeton University. And he basically says, we've got a system where the vast majority will be denied a liberal education so they can do manual labor for the rest of us. I mean, they've said it. It's gotcha. there. So it's for their benefit. It was the same you with know. Rockefeller. He said, he said, I don't, he said, I don't want a nation of thinkers. I want a nation of workers. Whenever he, he funded, I think it was millions of dollars into the public education system in the early 1900s is what Rockefeller said. Right. And they created the Columbia Teachers College and, you know, so, I mean, I, you know, it still blows my mind that there can just be a couple individuals with these really warped utopian socialists visions that can create our society. I mean, it's time for all of us to say, well, what do we want for our kids? I mean, I did a, um, a talk at a California Homeschool Association. It's like 2009 and it was on trust because I said, you know, the, 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 and this is, you know, maybe the biggest piece is what do you need to be able to home educate your kids? And I'm not taking homeschooling like reproducing school and it's trust. You have to trust that your children know what they came here to do and what they want to learn. And when I asked this whole room of parents, what do you want for your children? They all told me they just wanted their children to be happy. Nobody was like, I want them to get an A in math. You know, they just want their kids to be happy. And I guess the thing that helped me before I had children is that I did do the corporate path. And I worked for two U.S. senators and I like I like did the things that are supposed to make you happy. And I was I was making tons of money and I wasn't happy. And so I quit and I took a different direction and I became a certified coach. And I coached a lot of very successful executives who had everything that they promised. Right. They had the title and the status and the money and the stuff. And they would come to me and be like, Caprice, is this all there is? I feel so empty inside. So once you realize that the path to happiness that they're promising us is false, 
then you have to redefine what success looks like for you and your children. And then when you do that and you say, oh, you came with unique gifts from the creator, how are you going to realize those? Then education looks different. It's not about checking off the boxes and being not left behind and doing well on standardized tests. It's a completely different thing. Beautifully said. Well, I, we're definitely, we're, we're close to the top of the hour. If not, we went over it a little bit. Um, I think we're right at, at the hour, but Karen, I don't know if you had any uh, lasting questions for Caprice. Well, just kind of like, you know, like how unschooling is like not structured, but just kind of briefly, like what does a week look like for a kinder? How? What does a week look like for like a kindergartner or first grader? Like I know that you don't, you said something about like how you emailed like anthropologists or something like, right. So you just kind of follow their lead essentially is what you're doing. And then, well, yeah, I mean, I go into this a little bit more in my book, but it's okay. very important to have a rhythm for the day and the week Okay. because I found that if it's like, if there's no structure, kids get kind of lost, especially at that age. Yeah. So you need to give them a container and some structure. And within that, they have a tremendous freedom so it really depends on your individual child and it helps to have like a station for art and books and you want to have lunch at a certain time and nap time and field trips. So it's up to the family and it's like, it's also seasonal, but if you can create kind of a, a structure in which, okay, this is your independent time. This is our group time. This is mommy time to work. Like as long as it's consistent and it feels like a safe container then they have a lot of freedom, but it is important to have the rhythm in the container, especially at that age. Okay. Which her book's on the way. It should be here tomorrow. Okay. So we will have it. <laughs> yeah. I and, read like the long excerpt and I, you know, was, I had, you know, questions about that too, but we'll another time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, maybe we can talk again about more than nuts and bolts of it. Yeah. Oh, I'd love to. Yeah, definitely. I mean, your book's going to be on here with the, with the group of authors that we've had on the show before. I can't wait for your book to come tomorrow. Uh, we'll both probably awesome. read it because kind of have to, you know, with having those, with, with these kids that are three under five and it just seems like a beautiful, a, a more beautiful, beautiful path to have our kids take that path than to take the, the, the alternate route. Because to me, that seems like it's a dying, I, we, we both went through it, you know, and it just, it just doesn't seem like that that's the way that I want my kids to be. I want them to be free thinkers and I want them to grow that way and not the way right. of the government because I'm definitely not for the government, nor do I trust them. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I did take this over the summer. I took the book and made it into an online course if that's better for someone to kind of chunk it up. Oh. Even, even, better. even better. So where can people find you? Where, where, where can we find Caprice? My website is soulagency.org. Okay. Any, any other, are you on social media? Any, any of that stuff? Can people find you on YouTube? I, I need to get on more social media. I'm a look, reluctant social media user. Um, I guess right now I just point them to my website and, um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to sort out how I feel like I can be in integrity with myself and be on some of these social media platforms. Well, girl, you are good. You got a great message. You need to get out there. And, and I'm, I'm <laughs> okay. going to promote you on these social media platforms very within the next two days as, as much as I can, because you have a wealth of knowledge that needs to be told to the people. And, and I'm not saying you're 100% right. I'm not saying you're 100% wrong, but what you have to offer is beautiful. And I think that people should listen to that. And, and however you can do that, whether it's writing a book or creating more social media apps, I think that that'd be very beneficial to the population of the United States and, okay. and the world in I general. Will. But I will amplify my voice. <laughs> rock on, girl. I'm going to help you do that as much as I can. But All right. uh, thank you for joining. It's been a pleasure. Um, I would love to have you on again. Uh, that's completely up to you. But whenever we go down that road, we'll go down that road. Um, yeah, sorry. It's, it's, I don't have Johnny and Jess here, so it's a little different. But <laughs> You guys are great. I normally get, I'm, I'm so glad that Carrie Ann could join us. Yeah, no. Thanks for having me. It's been four years. She's kind of bit at me a few times in the past four years. Um, so I'm glad that this was – it was a long time waiting. It was kind of a perfect moment and timing for it to happen. Absolutely. Rock on. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Caprice, um, thanks for joining Talk Junkies. We'll talk with you another time, and I, and I hope the best for you and the best for your book, and have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thank you. Good night, both of you. Good night. Good night.
All right, ladies and gentlemen, there you have it, Caprice. Um, it was a wonderful podcast, good time. Um, I don't know, if, do you have any lasting thoughts for tonight? I know Callum's probably getting tired. <laughs> wants, a, wants a little boob, but uh, that was crazy. It was awesome. Yep. I don't have much to say right now. I'm... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, if you guys enjoy that podcast, the best thing you can do for this podcast is share, like, and subscribe. Comment down below. I guess on YouTube, that's like the, the most beneficial thing. I hope Mr. Beast isn't right in saying that TikTok will die in 2023 because YouTube pays out way more on their YouTube shorts, which is basically a copycat of, of TikTok, but you won't find me on YouTube shorts. Uh, but yeah, do all those things for this podcast. Caprice was awesome. That was some mind-blowing information, um, some things that I've never really thought about in education. She hit home on. So beautiful stuff there. Thank you for all our junkies out there. Stay fly. Ring the bell.